what's happening, guys. The other half of Civil War press conference is starting. This time, I would like to very much like to welcome the Team Cap. First on out of the gate, Paul Rudd himself. Anthony Mackie will be followed by his body. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Detroit! <laughs> uh, Anthony, it's not Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so awkward. Hi, Leslie. Uh, it's Sebastian Stan. Get on out here. <laughs> that still didn't come to fruition in a good way, and, and it really goes to show that a good movie lives and dies based on the directors. You, you could have all the other pieces in place, but unless you have quality storytellers, you may fall on your face. And so, uh, yeah, there's pressure, but not as much as you can, so <laughs> good luck. Yeah, you know, they did it. They did the job real well. Joe, speaking to you, as a director, you've done a lot of movies, and Something they're doing 
uh, really, really well, or, or something. Stop sucking! <laughs> <laughs> something All right. that might not be working, but uh, we, we do have a, a non-stop dialogue uh, uh, going at the monitor, so that by the time it takes over, we're very efficient, and also we do have a tendency, because we like to keep the energy up and don't want people getting in their heads, to shout out our direction sometimes and keep the camera rolling. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we try to give a, you know, two or three words of direction and, and, and keep moving because you can build a performance over multiple takes. You don't have to necessarily capture everything you want in a single take. You can layer it over six or seven takes. Well said. They're very, very, very <laughs> active friendly. You, know, they, like, they, you can see how they speak differently to different actors. They, they understand very quickly that you're going to have a different audience, whatever you want to say. You can see they address different people a different ways. But I did, I did, get, to, 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 I, did get, uh, I did get once a, uh, well, Joe, I, I, Anthony, I'm pretty sure, says this, uh, I forget what Anthony said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, and then Anthony would come running down. <laughs> uh, from Team Iron Man, we got like the slightest bit of snack talk. Uh, That's because they're old. <laughs> Oh, you mean Team Murphy? Like, that's what they call you guys lovingly. Team You're all Murphy? Why? Why? What does that mean? Do we have any gestures? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh! You know, like, the exercise? They're Team Quinoa. Well, team Quinoa. They're Team Quinoa. Well, team is so real. Right. Right. Baby oil, Team Baby Oil well over here. <laughs> Their team remember to take your Ginkgo Galuba so you can remember. <laughs> to us, these movies are about action, the characters express themselves through action. Uh, action has to have storytelling to it for us, so it's back to us and nice. superficial. And, you know, you can, you'll get tired of an action sequence if it's not either defining the character or moving the story forward in some way. Uh, it takes an incredible amount of effort and thank God we have such an incredible team of collaborators, including Kevin and Marcus McFeely and Nate Moore, who, uh, who, who works at Marvel as well. Who, who, can, who, who can work with us and keep us honest in terms of the storytelling, uh, and this cast, uh, who are also the caretakers of the characters in a way that we never could be. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's it, by far and away the hardest thing to do on a film. The easiest thing to do on a film is when you have a uh, Soderbergh level of cast like this uh, to, uh, to, to put down the dramatic scenes uh, on camera, especially uh, with, with actors of this caliber who've been playing these parts for this long. Uh, those are some of the easiest things we do. So the hardest thing we do uh, is is the is executing the action. And I think the, the toughest sequence by far in this film, which we literally probably just finished a, a week or two ago, was, uh, was the airport sequence. Uh, it's filled with a lot of moving parts, a lot of different characters. You want to move each character forward. You want to make sure that you're not leaving anybody behind. Uh, um, and uh, and you know, I think we, we, we went well into the post-process 
still reshaping and rethinking and, and reconfiguring that sequence to make sure that it had its, its maximum uh, a storytelling thrust to it. All right, now over on that side, right there, please. I'm Yuka from Japan. Uh, thank you for having us today. Uh, Mr. Evans showed great charm in wrestling against Mr. Adami Jr. at Kids Choice Award. That was hilarious. So I'd like to ask this question to all of you. Uh, if you challenge someone in Team I Am a Few Apple, uh, what kind of game would you dare? Who is your opponent and why? <laughs> several different ways of saying that because that just seems so you and was such a <laughs> amazing <laughs> and Jeremy still the messenger is amazing I love the film I just want to say that. <laughs> that's exactly how you sound it doesn't matter I don't know I think that was in the I think that was always in the script the uh, I think this belongs to you we you know we sometimes would play around with lines and stuff while we're shooting it, and these guys uh, uh, would suggest things, and but, and then sometimes we'd come up with the things after the fact. One of the great things about having a mask is that if you think of a great joke afterward, you don't have to, you don't have to match it to anything. <laughs> like the ADR. But that was, I think that was one that was, that was always in there. 
He's being modest. Paul is like one of the great improvisers um, uh, that you could hope to work with. But, uh, it, it is true when you, when you have the mask, and I think uh, uh, um, that was a great benefit to us in the post process. Again, in terms of modulating the tone in that uh, that section of the movie. Uh, but you know, we we had endless amounts of, uh, of jokes that uh, Ant and I and our editor Jeff Ford and Kevin would sit in the edit room and laugh about for hours and try to figure out, it was not an easy task, uh, which one was funnier than the other. Uh, and he, you know, he just gave us a welcome to that. There was something that I know about, please. No, I was just going to say thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him, there he goes. <laughs> 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 when I was kind of thinking about all of the superheroes at once, that there, some of the superheroes that, reply, that, uh, that rely on mechanized support, like you guys, and also Iron Man, also, a little bit more smart-assy. Is that <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do you think that, that, has, that one has anything to do with the other? Being mechanized versus being a smart ass? I didn't say like, that. R rather being like smart ass mechanized versus being one of the more like genetic Just based. knowing you got it. That's what you say. Say something clever, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is born with it versus needing uh, additional help? <laughs> yeah. We have to go back to that Gingo Galoo. Gingo Galoo. <laughs> Uh, good joke. That was a really good joke. It's a good joke. Uh, <laughs> that was great. You can use it. It's not that good. It's good. Uh, no, it's, it's really good. I, you know what it I feel like? Kills, it kills over 50. Anthony's huge with the AARP crowd. I am. <laughs> Call and can't remember where you at, babe. <laughs> oh, it's that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so you get a suit on your back, and you're a smart ass. Should I move on? Let's see if there's anybody else in the audience. Um, actually, this is still following to you, Paul, because, uh, you know, Spy Man's been sort of, uh... This is probably going to ask about Spider Man being like one of the better parts of the movie, but I also thought your part was great. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Because you know you were really excited. I mean, how excited were you worked to, to be able to meet everybody? And giant versus small, which was good. Small. How how I felt as far as being the fanboy of the group that that was not really uh, there was very little acting required <laughs> in that scene from me. You know, they've all worked together and done this before. I've just seen the movies. I mean, I've. Uh, seen all the Marvel movies, so to be there on the day, I kind of couldn't stop geeking out about it. I thought, oh my god, there's the shield. And, and, uh, and I thought, you know, there's that, there's that arm. There, you weren't looking. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> god damn it! And so, like, that, that kind of... That kind of thing, even when I was getting the suit on, you know, there's this area where we get changed and stuff, and um, it's like, oh, there's an uh, Iron Man suit. <laughs> <laughs> and there they all are. I did, I, I did feel that, that excitement of what, I can't believe that I landed here. This is nuts. Um, so it was really cool. I was the only one that you had worked with. So it was a little less impressive with the <laughs> <laughs> Minus Falcon. Yeah, yeah, you know, second time around. Yeah, yeah, it was like a little bit of a little hat. Yeah, it was cool. It's like, oh yeah, they're, there they are, the wings are there. But, uh, <laughs> maybe. Don't go ahead and you know what, it's, that's an apple and orange. You know. <laughs> you say tomato, I say cotton, I say ginkgo. <laughs> you say ginkgo, I say blue. Over there. Hey. Uh, my question is for uh, Kevin and Joe. Uh, you got to introduce a lot of the bug-centric superheroes into the mix of this film. 
uh, but we saw Ant-Man and Spider-Man, no Wasp. Um, can you explain the decision behind not bringing Evangeline Lilly into this film? Uh, there were drafts uh, where Wasp participated in the uh, splash panel fight, the airport, the airport battle. Um, and the truth is, it, it you took away the fun of seeing her suit up for the first time, of seeing her on that road to being a hero. We, we experienced that with, with, with Ant-Man in, uh, in uh, his own movie. We experienced that with Spider-Man in many movies. Um, and we had big plans, and we later announced the title of Paul's a sequel, which is Ant-Man and the Wasp. So we have very big plans to unveil her in her own movie, where she can be the entirety of the movie, and not a moment in, uh, in, uh, in an action scene. Kevin, I have a question for you because it's kind of hard as a, like an excited fan to like live in the moment of the movie because once you've seen it, you're like, oh my god, what's next, right? And I was wondering, as, as the Marvel Universe expands, like with some of the Netflix shows being considerably darker, having a different tone, do you feel that ripple effects are going to be felt from shows like that in the further cinematic universe? It might be, but I think what I love is is you now see in the film media, in the television media, the reflection of what the comics have always been. There's always been that great you know, diversity of tone in the comics, and I love that, uh, that we're seeing more and more of that uh, on, on, on various screens. So is that a yes? That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Uh, hello, this question is for Chris. Chris, I remember like a few years ago when you made the first Captain America, I told you like Captain America was kind of controversial in Latin America for different reasons, but it's been an like, interesting evolution. Your character, uh, he was supposedly like protecting the, the the true like the old American values, and in this case, he's just rejecting uh, the, con the the government control and maybe sure. the United Nations. So I would like you to talk about that. That's very interesting in this movie. The, the, sure. the way he's acting, right? Well, with regards to whether you know that was always a concern whether you know the, the name America, whether or not that would kind of uh, uh, polarize certain audiences, but the truth is, the, 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 the name America. I mean, what he stands for is something that's ubiquitous across the world. What you know, what he believes in, you know, honor and morality and values. That's something you can find anywhere. But in terms of who he's been throughout the arc of his character, you know, he's always kind of fought for the greater good. He's always kind of put the needs of the masses before his own desire. And that's exactly what's different in this film. Instead of the kind of uh, whoops, that, that, you know, put that in my lap for a second. Um, <laughs> and, and instead of kind of uh, dedicating, dedicating himself toward what others need, uh, in this film he kind of prioritizes what he wants, which is a departure from what he's normally allegiant to. So, so I think it's, it's, again, it colors the character in a really nice way. Uh, you know, you have a guy who's this incredibly austere and, and immoral character. It's hard trying to find ways to make him layered and dynamic, and I think in this movie he becomes potentially selfish, where, where he kind of puts his own desires first, but it's rooted in family, which is, I think, a, is a through line that we can all relate to. Thank you. Speaking of family, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, uh, as we got to know Hawkeye more, uh, how do you, why do you feel that he joined Cap's side immediately in the film? He's one of God. I think the private retirement is quite boring. Yeah, uh, you know, and then you know, go up front. Yeah, it's not, it's not the, the moral compass is, is that it's not far cry from, from Caps and TV as well. Anyway, at least that's how I see it. Uh, the sort of principle. He owes a debt to Scott Wick and her brother. So, uh, and yep. uh, she's under duress, it's a, uh, it, it's a call to arms. Yeah. That's actually one of my favorite parts of the all time. Mm -hmm. You and, anyway. Yeah. Keep talking. I, I just, I, I all of a sudden forgot you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Hello, uh, Jim McQuarrie with GeekDad.com. Uh, kind of an after question. Actors always fill in the gaps in the backstory in their head of stuff that informs the character that isn't in the script and that we never see. What is, all y'all can answer this, what is something that you know about your character that we don't know? <laughs> I think that's like an all-never-tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I kind of go on board with you that I think to some degree, I mean, this is almost like the way of being an actor in general. Some things, you know, certain things you want to share, certain things you don't. I think to some degree, it's almost nice having certain parts of the character that are intimate. And ultimately, at the end of the day, these guys do a good job of fleshing out the tones that they want you to see better than we ever could. That's one of the things when I was just doing the interview with you guys, you two and Kevin and the Russos, and they were just talking about how they form these stories and form these arcs. And you really think these things, I'm kind of deviating from the question, but it just feels worthy to bring up because it blew my mind. I've been doing these for a long time now, and we were having an interview, and they were talking about how they were going to a meeting Sometimes you think with these movies, these giant Marvel movies, any big movie where you think there's a thousand cooks in the kitchen, you assume there's some sort of formula, some algorithm that kicks in and there's a 30 people in suits being like, this is what it needs to be. But the truth is, it really is Joe and Anthony and Kevin and Nate in a room mapping out stories for so many characters, so many arcs, and they're making them real. They're making them actual fleshed out arcs and conflicts that are worthy of a film. It, all the explosions in the world aren't going to make you care. And, and it's, it's nuts to think that it really comes from a few people's brains. And uh, again, this, this is not exactly the answer to the question, but I think it was worth bringing up because it blew my mind because I've been doing this for a while and it was nuts to kind of realize it really does start from just a few people. The end. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to redirect that to you, Sebastian, because I think in this movie, uh, Why does Chris talk when he shouldn't? He <laughs> <laughs> oh, knows. We, like, he doesn't know a way. No. <laughs> this movie felt like, like we get Bucky back Do in we? a way, <laughs> right? And so, is there what was what was your process like in this film as opposed to when a soldier when he's not himself, he's not the captain? Well, just to piggyback on what Chris said, you know, I think. I'm always fascinated about the same thing. It's just, you know, for example, our writers, Christopher and Stephen, I mean, it's just phenomenal to me the way that they were able to write a script that gave every character a moment, an arch, uh, you know, an arc. And, and particularly, I think they were the ones that kind of figured it the temperature of, of Bucky Marks. You know, how much of the guy is, is back from the first movie, how much of the Winter Soldier's there. And, and for me, it was just sort of taking it off the page and, and following them, you know. Uh, but a lot of that, I think, is determined in the, in the writing and then also in the decision that these guys make, you know. And the fun part for me is I never know, you know, uh, where they're going to take it, so. In the last movie, I remember you were practicing in my book with the plastic silverware. Yeah, this well, is I'm me driving. imitating you, by the way. Um, <laughs> did you do, were you keeping that up this time, or did you not need it? No, I didn't do that. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no. All right, who has the mic on this side? Right ahead. Uh, Trevor Norkey, com. I have a question for Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, so in Age of Ultron, you were all like scared of your powers, and then in Civil War, you started to gain some confidence, but you still did not really control, and you're still terrified of your powers. Do you think Scarlet Witch will ever be able to have any confidence with her, like real confidence with her powers, or do you think this is the peak of her confidence level? I mean, I, I think... What ended up happening was that she was starting to feel confident. That it was more, it wasn't about her powers, it was more about um, the, the conflict she had with making a big mistake. Um, but I think what's interesting is every superhero has a weakness, and I've always thought of her as um, she's the person who gets in her way, um, that she's kind of limit, limitless. Um, and so that's to me an interesting character trait. I don't know what we're going to do next, but. Um, I'm, I think of her as being like an incredibly strong, powerful person, and I, and it's also fun because I feel like she she could flip either way because of her um, her mind. I think she I think there are a lot of things that could possibly be played with, but I'm not in control of that. Um, but I think this film was a lot about just conflict in general um, of what's right, um, how to use your abilities or whether you should or not. I think that's, that was a consistent theme throughout the whole film. So I think it was just consistent with that as opposed to her being not confident. She is on a growth arc. Yeah. And it is, uh, it is part of her development. It's very tricky with very powerful characters because unless they have an internal struggle or a flaw that limits them, then they do become limitless. And then the storytelling becomes um, muddled and, and, and not very interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, she could have stopped that flight at the airport in, in, in five seconds if she were at the peak of the power. 
dollars. So uh, it really, you know, really has to do with um, um, you know her character specifically going on a journey to understand uh, uh, what the limits of her power are, her powers are. She makes a mistake very early in the movie that sets her back, and uh, and you know we'll, we'll get to see where she goes in the film. Over on that side. Hey, yes, I'm Joe May, Philadelphia Daily News. My question on two of them. One for Chris. Um, I, one of my most touching moments, I mean, the human side, um, was saying goodbye to um, Peggy, and then also the joy of finally making a pass for the first time in 75 years. And um, <laughs> for, <laughs> for Kevin, what was that? Um, for, yes. um, the joy of making a pass to oh, uh, oh, share. Sure, sure. So, yeah, 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 I guess I make out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, for Kevin, um, it seems like you have a pleasant problem. <laughs> it's like, I think after this film, everybody gets such a high point. Um, everybody can carry their own solo film. People are going to be clamoring for Captain America 4 and maybe a War Machine movie, and that would be a good idea. And how do you um, deal with that pleasant problem? Well, with that, how do you deal with what? How do you deal with that pleasant problem? That other one, everyone, great. Hey, listen, that, that's, that's, listen, Marvel's, and I'm, I'm, you know, I've been really talking a lot about this in press, but it really is, over the course of the, you know, I've been doing this for a while now, and it really is nice to kind of step back. I mean, the first couple of years of your involvement of the franchise, you're very internal, you're scared about being the thing that's going to cause it. You're going to be awful and you're very terrified in a very egoic manner. But as you kind of continue on the journey, you kind of realize how amazing it is what they're doing and what they're accomplishing and how fortunate you are to be a part of it. This unbelievable interwebbing of, of stories and you kind of are just so uh, fortunate to be a part of it. And I say, keep going. Let's keep going. Let's let the wave get bigger and bigger because it's not stopping. It's not like they're making bad movies. They're making great movies. And you want to, you want to keep putting in this... Superhero box, you can, but the fact is, it's still good movies. It's good movies that, that they, especially the Russos, they ground them in such an authentic way. It's real humans, real struggles, real conflict, good cinematic storytelling with like a streak of superhero flavor in it. So I say, keep going. Like, if you can keep doing it, keep doing it. It's funny you were saying that because I actually had a moment the other day where I was thinking of the, when I was going up to the Back, the Back to the Future trilogy, and to me, like, I feel like. <laughs> They're going to remember this this trilogy in the same way. That's how I feel. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing that it's happening. It's unprecedented, and it's it's. I don't know how you do it outside of the the, the use of the existing properties of the comic book world. And it's and they they've got a monopoly. They got it. They're doing it. No one else can try and copy. It, you know what I mean? It's it's really unbelievable to try and venture out into these uncharted waters and do it so well. It it's just really impressive. What was the first part of the question? Oh, that's something else. Oh, Peggy and Sarah. Oh, Peggy Parker. Yeah, they're playing Okay, that's right. Yeah, they can out. Yeah, that's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the best. Uh, you know, um, it certainly has a nice element of Steve's struggle. You know, you got, you know, it's like when you have friends you had from high school and you try and make your friends from high school, get along with your friends from college. And you, you, it's, it's, it's this blending of the world, and Steve has this part of him where it's Bucky and Peggy from his old life, and then he has his new family. And this movie makes these worlds collide. Um, and it's, it's difficult and challenging. And certainly the loss, well, we all know the movie, right, guys, Anna? Yeah. Loss of Peggy. <laughs> the loss of Peggy certainly makes Bucky the last remaining part of Steve that is uh, a part of his, his old self, his, his, his memory of home, of who he is before this Shields, you know, I just sounds stupid, so sorry. Just, it's who Steve was before he, you know, had this responsibility. Um, but they, he, they are 99 years old. Thank you, get in there, please. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just take over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't know what I was saying, but it's, it's nice to, you know, when you lose Peggy, Bucky becomes so much more meaningful. And, and it really becomes, um, that's what motivates Steve to become Selfish. You know, it, it, you got the most selfless guy in, in, in comic books all of a sudden saying, I care a little bit more about my relationship than what it means to you guys. And, and he's, he's taking his current family. The guy's only looking to a place to fit. He's looking for home. And he's found it with his current Avengers, but Bucky's that Achilles heel. And it's, 
it's impossible to pit him that against his current family. And he chooses his old family, which is, again, a little bit of a selfish thing, but that's something he's never done before, and it's, it's new territory. And it's, it's a gray area that he has, and he's a very, Joe uses this, and I love it. He's, Steve's a very binary guy. It's this or that. And, and with Bucky, it becomes gray. And I think it's, it's tough for him. He, he chooses Bucky. So Thank here you. you go. In Civil War, Cap, he's 90, he's selfish, he loves to He's kiss. 90, he's selfish, <laughs> and he just wants to get kissed. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the time that we've got, you guys. Thank you so much to Team Cap.